Welcome to the British Library and to the return of the Jalak Prize. Yes, the Jalak is back. We're so delighted to host this very special prize here in the British Library for the second year running. And it's my great excitement to hand over to the one and only, your host for tonight, the one and only Professor Sunny Singh. A big applause, everybody. <laughs> and welcome to everyone who has logged in from home to the Jalak Prize 2022. I am Sunny Singh, one of the founders of the prize and its current director. We have a rather wonderful program lined up for you, you all at home, featuring readings from the brilliant writers shortlisted for the Jalak Prize and the Jalak Children's and Adults Pri Young Adult Prize. We also have a lovely celebration of our 12 bookshop champions, which are Woohoo! Independent bookshops across the country who have each championed a book from our short list and of course our short and long list in general. Take note, cheer them, and tomorrow and beyond, pop in and buy a book from our short list or any book at all from one of our bookshop champions or indeed your local independent. A little bit of housekeeping before we kick off the readings. The online version of this event will be live captioned, so please enable yours if you need it. The viewing links will be available for 48 hours after the event for catch up. Following the readings and celebration of the Bookshop Champions, we will return here to this room to celebrate great contemporary British writing. We will be joined by our judges for the Jalak Prize, that is Mary Jean Chan, Shemaine Soleiman, and Stephen Thompson and judges of the Jalak Children's and Young Adult Prize, Sophia Ahmed, Ni Ayikwe Parks, and Patrice Lawrence. In addition to the announcement of the winners of the, our two awards, the two Jalak artists in residence, Elijah Vardo and Rickon Parekh, will reveal the unique works of art they have created specially as trophies for our 2022 winners. Further information on Jalak Prize celebrations including book giveaways, video clips of shortlisted writers, and much more can be found on our website, www.jalakprize.com, and on social media. You can use JalakPrize22 or JalakPrize hashtags uh, to look us up or indeed to add your own. So now, pour yourself your favorite beverage, sit back, and enjoy the show. Hi, I'm Arifa Akbar. I'm going to read a few pages of my memoir, um, Consumed a Sister's Story. Three summers ago, my neighbour was told that her ovarian cancer had reached the terminal stage. Rosalind Hibbins emailed the occupants of the building about it matter-of-factly, as was her way, but when I went downstairs to see her, she seemed instantly changed by the news. She was in her late sixties and had always been an indomitable woman as strong and sturdy as the boulders she'd brought home from her stone carving workshops, which had become a passion since retirement. In the days that followed, she seemed made of air, white-haired and fragile, her, her eyes watery bright, her voice catching on itself in croaks and quivers. A couple of months before Rosalind's diagnosis, my sister, Fauzia, had died suddenly, leaving me suspended between shock and disbelief. She'd been shuttling back and forth to acute hospital wards in North London with an illness her doctors couldn't diagnose. But we didn't believe Fazi was going to die and she couldn't have believed it either. She'd been worrying about her cats and college assignments, sending texts and paying bills from a hospital bed. She hadn't been preparing for death like Roslyn. I was left reeling, so I had to muster all my courage when Roslyn called from a hospice and said she'd like to see me. I followed my A to Z around the twisting back streets of Belsize Park to find the hospice. It was set back from the road and obscured by trees as if in hiding. I'd grown up nearby in Primrose Hill without ever realising it was there. Inside, Rosam asked if Fauzi had been alone when she died. 
It was the thing she was most afraid of, she said, and it made me think about how my sister might have felt with no one she knew around her in the early hours of the June morning when blood had started to pour into her brain and collect into a fatal hemorrhage. Rosalind must have sensed my distress because she tried to comfort me. Don't hold on too tightly, she said. She'll come back to you. I remember, after school, a park, pigeons and a bench with metal scrolled arms. I'm wearing a skirt, the bench spat digging into my legs. So instead, I'm sitting on my hands, waiting for Rania, who's high on top of the new roundabout, a witch's hat, on the highest rung, her hair flung back. I remember a dog I was scared of and wanted to run I miss my sister shouting, don't run Ruby, don't run from the top of her perch. But I took flight, I ran anyway, my school satchel bumping at my hip, thwack, thwack on the jointed bone and the dog chasing and barking at my side and Rania jumping off and landing on her knee, the patella shattering like a walnut, the sound of her scream a high, pure scream of distilled pain. And the yellow dog's owner was at her side, the dog captured and tied to a stump, and Rania crying, grabbing me by the wrist. I told you not to run, Ruby, you silly girl, you stupid, dumb girl, Ruby. The wet feeling on the back of my thighs. I'd been bitten by the Alsatian, but had I been bitten, or had I passed water? Where was mum? I didn't know. I remember my mother earlier in a blue tunic with white flowers, standing under a bright golden haired tree, which I now know to be mimosa. I thought I saw her flickering like a candle under the mimosa for a few seconds. She was there, I thought, and then she was gone. Hello, my name is Anthony Vanny Capildeo, and I'm delighted to be reading alongside the other writers on the Chalak Prize Longlist 2022. I'll be reading to you from my collection, Like a Tree Walking, published by Carconet. It's a very pink book. And I'm reading to you from Charles Causley's study in Cypress Well in Launston, Cornwall, which kindly has been lent to me. Reader. I turn men into deer. Told me about a childhood, running free through a rainforest. Those were the best days. On all those paths, he never saw a snake. Told him about a childhood within walls. Snake in the post box, snake let to unearth to riddling. Never seen snake of the drain, moving heavy stones we put to block its resting place. Yard had the displaced inhabitants of forest. He would have been running through with his gun and smoke bright eyes, decades and decades. What you see, what you do, what you say, what you know, what you believe, what you have been storying yourself in storage, your storied self. Decades and decades is dangerous. Forest becomes forensics. The frond is dissected. Oh, it waves over all those paths. Equivocations. You see, you do, to me, as if I am a woman. Come on, he says, to control. Coming on, he knows. Control, you believe, the narrative. What thorns mistaken for companions? What canopy? What shutting out? He discs his eyes. His hooves hurt. Hi, um, uh, my name is Tija Jin. 
Um, so I'm going to read a small part from my book, Keeping, Keeping the House, today. Um, this one. <laughs> so the section I'm reading is one of the last times that we see a character called Gemina for a little while. She's quite an important character. Um, Bread Knives and Little Hills, 2007 A Peugeot 106 laid a trail for another car to follow. It set off loudly down Tottenham High Road, four men inside rattling past the police station before police lost sight of it. Earlier in these nights, these four men had waved one ticket out of balance of demanding four for one entry. They promised that with them inside the whole place would light up. One of the men spoke in the retivals of the sativa high. With each of the bouncer's rejections, his concentration broke and came back in. Gradually, his fingers carved through the air like carrion picking bones, sharp and deliberate. He stood in a halo of smoke, watched by girls in little hills and jeans, holding cigarettes in their hands, mouths ajar. Inside, the dance floor was carpeted, and its smell of peppermint. It was ravey, with an hour in the middle for a cipher, focus turning. When the beats shift into another wave, you have to catch the moment where your moving changes. Correct yourself. Dancing as exercise. Carry on till you're gasping. Water, water. Elbow tappers popping up. Water, water. Cups of water. Second-hand flavour, bit of a twist. Hi everyone, my name is Sabah Khan. I am the author and artist of this book called The Bowls We Play. Um, it's a graphic novel, which means that it's um, a combination of drawings and writing. Um, and today I'm going to be reading through one of the chapters with you. Um, and what I'll be doing is screen sharing the pages of the book so you can read the drawings whilst I um, read the text out. Um, so just bear with me one second whilst I do that. There we go. Cool. The roles we play. Chapter 14, uh, Other, with a soundtrack by artists Leatherette and their song titled After Dawn. At what point did I become aware that my identity was politicized? Was it on 15th Feb, 2003, my first protest, millions of us against the war, all of us ignored? Was it on Tuesday, 11th September, 2001, when I was sitting in my philosophy class and I learned new terms and new uses of ancient words? Or perhaps it was the first time I was made to feel different. All these experiences my body would carry, silently I held them close, inadvertently giving them the power to inform key junctures and crossroads of life. One such time was at the end of college, filling in UCAS forms, when I had to decide what path my future would take. I had applied for two different subjects with two different personal statements, Arabic, law. I didn't want to do either of them. I wanted to do fashion, but drawing people is haram, I would tell myself. Why don't you apply for an art foundation? It's one year and you can use that year to decide if you want to continue or if you want to go on to other stuff. This makes sense. I set about applying to the same art foundation my friend was aiming for. Apply for a prestigious art school here, tick. I tell my parents, I'd spent my life making clothes. I want a better life for you, but I need a lawyer. I tell my A-levels textiles teacher my plans. You're going to apply for that art school. <laughs> Good luck.
Hi, my name is Kai Miller, and I'm going to read the beginning of an essay in this book, Things I Have Withheld. And the essay that I'll read from is called The Boys at the Harbour. In Kingston at night, the harbour is beautiful, almost as beautiful as the boys who gather around it. The boys who are still young and still have dreams as big and bright as the fireworks that light up the waterfront each new year. On that night, the first day of the year, the waterfront does not belong to the boys, but to a new throng of people who wouldn't normally venture into this part of town. People who have learned a long time ago how not to see these boys. And maybe even tonight, though it isn't the new year, if you pass by the harbour, you will not see them either, sitting as they do in the shadows, under the sweet almond trees, these boys talking about their big and bright dreams. It hurts a little to hear them speak these dreams, to hear them speak about a future I sometimes doubt will be theirs. I'm going to live in one of them big, big hours upon the hilltop, the boy says, looking behind, not to the water, but to the hills that rise over this brutal city. I follow his gaze and look to those lights, glittering like sequins on the hills, the hills to which the New Year's crowd will return. The house that I grew up in is on those hills as well, and I too will return there in just a couple of hours. My father's house is emitting one of those lights. I'm, I'm not going to work for nobody neither, the boy continues. I'm going to be my own boss. Just a little money for start my business. That's all I need. He says none of this as if it is a question, as if the future is in, is in any doubt. He says it as a simple fact, something that will happen in the near future. Hello, my name is Sarida Abike Iemide, and I am here today to read from Ace of Spades, which is my debut novel. Chapter 1. Devon. Monday. First day black assemblies are the most pointless practice ever, and that's saying a lot, seeing as Nivius Academy is a school that runs on pointlessness. We are seated in Lion Hall, named after one of those donors who give money to private schools that don't need it, waiting for the principal to arrive and deliver his speech in the usual order. Welcome back for another year. Glad you didn't die this summer. Here are your senior prefects and head prefect. School values, thin. Don't get me wrong, I'm all for structure. Ask any of my friends. Correction, friend. I'm pretty sure that even though I've been here for almost four years, no one else knows I exist. Just Jack, who generally acts like there's something seriously wrong with me. Still, I call him a friend because we've known each other forever and the thought of being alone is much, much worse. But back to the thing about structure. I'm a fan. Jack knows about the many rituals I go through before I sit down at the piano. Without them, I don't play as well. That's the difference between my rituals and these assemblies. Without these, life at Nivius would still be an endless drudge of gossip, money, and lies. The microphone screeches loudly, forcing my head up. 20 minutes of my life about to be wasted on an assembly that could have been an email. I lean back against my chair as a tall, pale guy with dull black eyes, oily black hair slicked back with what I'm sure was an entire jar of hair gel and a long, dark coat that almost sweeps the floor, stands at the podium, staring down at us all like we're vermin and he's a cat. My name is Mr. Ward, but you must all address me as Headmaster Ward, the cat says, voice liquid and slithery. I squint at him. What the hell happened to Headmaster Collins? The room is filled with confused whispers and unimpressed faces. As I'm sure some of you are aware, Headmaster Collins resigned just before summer break, and I'm here to lead you all through your final year at Nivius Academy. The cat finishes, his lips pursed. Hi everyone, Mallory Blackman here, and I'm going to read from the book that Dapo and I created called We're Going to Find the Monster. Yay! Charlie and Eddie were playing in the garden. Breakfast in 10 minutes, called Dad. Come on, said Charlie. We need to find the monster. But it's breakfast time. He'll be grumpy, said Eddie. He'll be grumpy and hungry, said Charlie. 
He'll be grumpy and hungry and snappy, said Eddie. He'll be grumpy and hungry and snappy and prickly, they both said together. Shh, we'll need to be very careful. And off they went. We're going to find the monster. They sailed over a shimmering ocean. Look out, there's a whale, Eddie pointed. No problem, said Charlie, and she rowed their boat quickly round it. Over the shimmering ocean, we're going to find the monster. They began to climb a huge high mountain. Look out, a hungry wolf. Don't worry, said Charlie. And she sang a soft, sweet song to soothe it. Then she gave it a massive hug and sent it on its way. Over the shimmering ocean, up the huge high mountain, we're going to find the monster. They crept through a deep, dark jungle. Look out, a fearsome, fierce tiger, said Eddie. They hid in a cave, but only just in time. The most fearsome, fierce tiger in the whole world slunk past. Eddie and Charlie held their breath until it had gone. Phew, that was close. Hello. My name is Jeffrey Boachi and this is my book, Musical Truth, The Musical History of Modern Black Britain in 28 Songs. Um, I'm going to read a chapter called Ghost Town, which is about a song called Ghost Town by a band called The Specials from 1981. Can you imagine living in an actual ghost town? Stumbling through deserted streets, shivering at every wailing gust of wind, heart racing at every creak. Imagine the spooky old buildings and dusty cracked windows, the abandoned shops and gloomy skies. And can you imagine what would have had to have happened for the place where you live to end up like that in real life? Some people don't have to imagine this. For them, it's just normality. Urban decay has been a backdrop for black communities in the UK since black people started to arrive in this country in large numbers. It's what tends to happen to immigrants arriving in a new country gathering together in large cities where there's a better chance of finding work and housing, but finding that the work is low paid and the housing is run down. By 1981, this inner city environment had become pretty normal for most black communities, and it came with problems. Unemployment had been on the increase since the mid 1960s. By 1980, 1.5 million people were out of work in the UK. For the working classes, people who have to work, this meant that life became more difficult. Shops were closing down, work was hard to find, and money was scarce. The song Ghost Town is all about this environment. It's a haunting, eerie song that echoes through images of a very broken Britain. All of this should make Ghost Town a depressing song to listen to, but it really isn't. The reason for this has a lot to do with something called two-tone. The two-tone movement was all about black and white people coming together to make music and share culture. It was influenced heavily by ska, a traditional type of reggae music that young white musicians in places like Coventry grew up listening to in the 1960s. Two-tone took ska and combined it with modern genres to make a whole new sound that was West Indian, British, up-to-date and traditional all at the same time. Hi, I'm Mainty Chan and I'm the author of Danny Chung Does Not Do Maths. I'm going to read an extract from the first chapter. Drawing makes me feel good. I draw literally everywhere, in bed with a torch and even on the toilet. Well, you can be sat for quite a while and yes, I always wash my hands afterwards. Sometimes I sketch in the park at weekends with Ravi, my best mate. My favourite bit is coming up with new characters. One's a half one thing and half another. The best of both worlds. Like wholemeal bread and white bread put together. 
I was really pleased with my newest creation that I called a Drekken. It was a mutant duck with a dragon's head. It's very Chinese, if you ask me. Dragons are the most beloved and lucky creatures in Chinese mythology, and ducks are yummy and succulent. The tricky part was the head. Chinese dragons don't look like other dragons, and they have no wings. Ravi is basically an expert on all things medieval knights. He says that Chinese dragons are anomalies, which is a nice way of saying they're weird. And they don't go around trying to eat princesses or battle knights. I think that's nice. A dragon is a Chinese win-win. From under my duvet, I heard the door to my room squeak open. Danny, where are you? It was Ba. I could tell from the sesame oil smell from the kitchen. Not now, I prayed. I was still drawing. I nearly finished the camel-like head of the dragon. The duck's body would, of course, be in scale with the head. You wouldn't want a tiny duck's body and a massive dragon's head. That thing would lollop around and flop over. I slid my duvet up over my head some more, hoping that Bar wouldn't see me. Saturday was usually very busy, so my parents wanted me to help out by folding menus or piling pop cans on the shelf behind the counter. But I'd rather just draw in my pyjamas instead. I am Rebecca Henry, the author of The Sound of Everything. Um, it's my first novel, and I am just going to do a quick reading from the start of the book. Chapter One. I can tell from the get-go when I'm not wanted. When you're just another foster kid, sometimes it seems like eventually everyone stops caring, except to get chatty-patty about you before you've even walked in the door. I'm one of those girls. People know about me before they meet me. I'd like to think that Mr Tucker sat me at the front of his history class to make sure I'm doing okay. It's probably more like he was given a folder labelled Katie Hunt, which advised him to sit me under his nose where he could keep one eye trained on me. At the moment, I'm actually supposed to be a Lucas, but I've always kept my real name. I rock back in my chair and test it in my head. Katie Lucas. Yeah, it was a good ring. I could fit in. I've got standings. Apart from the whole rapper-singer thing, my fashion sense is on point, and I live in the same house as Miss Popularity. Katie! An explosion on the desk in front of me jolts me back into perspective. I start, dropping my chair back into place and bore my hands into tight fists. Mr Tucker has a thing with whacking wooden board rubbers on the desk to get people's attention. I'm pretty sure I felt some reverb in my bones. Remind me when the suffragette movement was. He taps the board rubber insistently on the desk. I've only been at this school three weeks, but I know he won't stop until I've given him my attention. I grit my teeth. Stop banging that stupid piece of wood. Mr Tucker's eyebrows shoot up. He stops banging the board rubber. Lose the earphones and pay attention. Next time I see them, you're staying after school, and that's me being ridiculously lenient. Open your ears and listen to me. I manage to resist the urge to roll my eyes. Listening is effort, and for the most part, I don't do effort. Hi, my name's Manjeet Mann, and this is a reading for the Jalak Prize from The Crossing. 300 and 66 days before. Natalie. Everyone is crying but me. Seven days since she passed. Seven days, 11 hours, 43 minutes and 16 seconds, counting the days, hours, minutes to stop myself from drowning. Everyone is crying but me. Dad squeezes my shoulder. Be brave now. I walk towards the front of the church, seven days, 11 hours, 53 minutes, and nine, 10, 11, 12. Everyone is crying but me. I'm trying to remember how to breathe, my desert dry mouth, hands trembling, I swallow sand. It feels like an eternity before I find my voice. Everyone is crying but me. Tears stream down Dad's face, he's given up on wiping them away. His voice cracks as he reminds everyone of who she was. Catherine, Kate, Kitty. Her laugh, joyful life, mermaid, wonderful mother, beautiful wife, activist, big heart. My mum. Everyone is crying. 
everyone, even me. Sammy. Me and Mama have lain here on the cold floor for hours or seconds. It's hard to know anything right now. I lie next to Baba, his warm hands turned cold. I want more than anything to breathe life back into him. Baba was fearless in a country ruled by fear. I wish I was like you, I would say. My son, the stargazer, he would say. You are perfect just as you are. Welcome to the Jalak Prize 2022. <laughs> and welcome again to our viewers at home. This is our first in-person celebration of the awards since 2019, so we are a little excited. Yeah. <laughs> I am Sonny Singh, I'm one of the founders of the Jalak Prize and its current director. And we are joined by our judges today for the Jalak Prize Mary Jean Chan, Shemaine Suleiman, and Stephen Thompson, who unfortunately couldn't be here, as well as judges of the Jalak Children, Children's and Young Adult Prize, Sifia Ahmed and Patrice Lawrence. And I think Nia Yikwe Parks is somewhere on his way. It's been a tough day. <laughs> um, so if he arrives, we've got, we've got space waiting for him. In addition to announcing the winners of our two awards this evening, we also reveal to you the unique works of art created specially to serve as the 2022 tr winners trophies by our two Jalak artists in residence, Elijah Vardo and Rickin Pare. Also, <laughs> also, further information on Jalak Prize, including book giveaways, video clips of the shortlisted writers, and much more can be found via our website, jellicprize.com, and on social media, hashtags jellicprize22 and jellicprize. A quick introduction to the Jellic Prize. Founded in 2016, the prize exists to celebrate the rich array of exceptional work from writers of color in Britain, whether it be fiction, nonfiction, short stories, graphic novels, or poetry. The prize is also open to self-published writers. A new sister award, the Jellic Children's and Young Adult Prize, was announced in 2020, with the first award made in 2021 and won by one of our judges, Patrice Lawrence. Woo! Woo! <laughs> Open to a broad church of genres and forms, both, aw both award a thousand pounds to the winner as well as a unique work of art created by artists chosen for the annual Chalak Art Residency. We believe that the most profound and greatest of changes are brought about not by individuals, but by collective efforts of people organizations and institutions working together. This community-based ethos also means we work with and partner with like-minded organization, organizations. This is why, first of all, I would like to thank and honor our partners who make this prize and celebration possible. First of all, thank you to our anonymous benefactor who provides the prize checks for the winners. Uh, thanks also to our anonymous sponsors who fund the annual Jalak Artists in Residence. There's a lot of people who do quiet work. A shout out to author Dorothy Coomson, who initiated the idea of the Jalak Art Residency, and that project would not exist without her. From the beginning, the Historic Authors Club has supported the prize and continues to do so. 
The pandemic pushed the prize online in 2020, but also resulted in a fruitful collaboration with the British Library that hosted our globally available online awards in 2021 and are providing today's hybrid celebration with an in-person reception as well as a globally live streamed event. Starting this year, we are delighted to partner with the London Library this partnership grants all shortlisted writers one year of compl complimentary memberships. The winner received two years complimentary membership. The London Library also hosted our first in-person shortlist event since 2019, this past April. We are delighted to be able to share possibly the most writerly of libraries in the world <laughs> with more of our community of writers and readers. There is a special place in our hearts for National Book Tokens, with whom we have partnered for the past two years. They have helped us highlight and maximize sales potential of books by writers of color across Britain. Our partnership means that bookshops up and down the country support our shortlisted titles with creative in-store displays and promotions across websites and social media. In 2022, this year, Waterstones, Foils, Blackwells, bookshop.org, and over 120 independent bookshops are promoting our shortlist. I didn't think that, was hap that would happen when we started in 2016. Um, so it's really important. Moreover, for a second year, 12 independent bookshops across Britain are not only promoting our shortlist, but are also championing a shortlisted book each with author events, podcasts, Spotify playlists, giveaways, and more. We know that independent bookshops are best placed to reach readers in their communities and can not only showcase and sell. <laughs> uh, was that a bit of a glitch? Um, yeah, I don't, want, I don't want to hear myself, thank you. Um, we know that independent bookshops are best placed to reach readers in their communities and can not only showcase and sell books by writers of color, but they can also nurture an expanded, expanding base of potential book buyers. We are grateful to our 2022 bookshop champions, some of whom are here with us today. So thank you, Afrori Books, Brighton, Five Leaves Bookshop, Nottingham, La Biblioteca, Sheffield, Lighthouse Bookshop, Edinburgh, Mostly Books, Abingdon, October Books, Southampton, Shelf Life, Books and Zines, Cardiff, Story Smith, Bristol, and Children's Bookshop, Newham Books, Roundtable Books, and Pages of Hackney in London. Thank you. Also, a huge shout out to Apple Books, who have Jalak Prize curated lists. So if the fruit phone is your friend, look us up there. Also, a massive thank you for sp to Spread the Word, whose 2015 report, Writing the Future, was the spark that led to the Jalak Prize. They have provided copies of the extraordinary anthology, Runaways London, published by Ink, Sweat and Tears, and featuring young poets and artists of color who have excavated silenced histories of people of color in 17th and 18th century London for our in-person guests today. These are talents to watch, and I would recommend you take a copy. We also want to thank the bookseller for their constant and much needed support and for hosting our very loud table at 2022 <laughs> Nibbies this past Monday. That laugh tells you all you need to know. <laughs> we have an outsized public image, so it is often not known or is forgotten that the Jalak Prize is run entirely by volunteers. If you are with us in person, you will see most of our team here. But a huge thank you to Jamila Ahmed, who cannot join us today, Tashmir Owen, Hamza Jahanzeb, Kate Birch, and Shai Hussain, who you may spot around the event today, and many, many other wonderful folk who prefer to be unsung heroes. Now, these unsung heroes include the many donors for Books to Readers, who make it possible for us to get books into the hands of people who would not be able to access them otherwise. And with that, now to business at hand. <laughs> we start with unveiling 
the two works of art created by Jalak artists in residence, Elijah Vardo and Rickon Parag. The Jalak Art Residency annually commissions a unique work of art by an artist of color to serve as a trophy for the prize. In 2021, the residency was expanded to an annual commission to an illustrator of color to create an original work, of work for the children's ch Jalak Children's and Young Adults Prize. The aim of the residency, as with the prize, is to shine a light on artists of color in contemporary Britain to recognize their creative output and celebrate their works. The 2022 artists in residence are Elijah Vardo, who created the trophy for Jalak Prize, and Rickon Parak, who is amongst us here today, who created the trophy for the Jalak Children's and Young Adult Prize. Elijah Vardo's, you will be able to see it, my grandmother's hands draws on his Romani heritage and celebrates the long tradition of oral storytelling. He drew inspiration from stories that are etched and carried on our skins and specifically in his grandmother's hands, which appear in the work, which is a mix of wash, pencil, and ink on paper. Unfortunately, Elijah can't be here with us today, although he assured us that he's watching this at home, so give him a big cheer. <laughs> and he's watching it with his grandmother, so. Aww. And Rickon is here with us today, so do give him a Woo! big shout. Do you want to come up for a quick, take a quick bow? Come on, take a quick bow. <laughs> Rickon Barrick drew on his own heritage and love of illustrating animals to create a postage stamp of a lion from the Gear, Gear Forest in Gujarat. In India, the lion symbolizes not only courage, but also protection and safety. Rickon illustrates in an analogous fashion, and the illustration is created using dip pen, inking brush, watercolors, Indian ink, and a very steady hand. <laughs> There's also an Easter egg, which I'll let you know or guess afterwards. Thank you, Rickon. <laughs> And now to our shortlists. Six books are selected for each prize, and this year the lists showcase a wide range of genres, biography, graphic memoir, narrative fiction, poetry, essays, and picture books. Taking in identity, grief, mental illness, heritage, family, gender, class, and race, the titles explore a myriad of themes through invent inventive narratives. The 2020 shortlist, 22, 2022, I missed the last couple of years, you can see that. <laughs> 2022 Jalak Prize shortlist includes Consumed by Arifa Akbar, Scepter. <laughs> a beautiful and unflinchingly honest memoir of a family and especially a sibling portrait that grows to encompass medical history, art, culture, and so much more. Somebody Loves You, Mona Arshi, and other stories. <laughs> an elegant debut novel by an award-winning poet which offers chapters as little gems and reads like a prose poem as much as a layered nuanced novel. Like a Tree Walking by Anthony Varney Capildeo, a poet. <laughs> A poetry collection that is flawless. And if you look f must look for a flaw, maybe a little too long, but that's it. <laughs> and it leaves the reader gasping for breath and with its ex with gra gasping for breath with its exquisite language and profundity of ideas. Keeping the house. Tishis. <laughs> and of the story, a brilliant, constantly surprising debut novel that is confident in how it plays with form and style, and it's at once engrossing and challenging. The Roles We Play, Sabah Khan. <laughs> a 
graphic memoir with images that are absolutely stupendous and a fine balance of text and imagery. This is, a psycholo this is psychologically astute, powerful, and haunting. And finally, things I have withheld. Kai Miller, Canon Gate Books, which is an accomplished. <laughs> I'm hoping Kai's watching from across the pond because that's where he is. Um, accomplished collection of essays by a fearless writer. This is extraordinary writing, unflinching and uncompromising in its ideas and stunning in its language. Now, you think I'm going to announce the winner right now, but no. <laughs> we, we believe in equity, so we're going to go down the shortlist for both our awards. The 2022 Children's and Young Adults shortlist. Ace of Spades. <laughs> Farida Abiki Iimide. Usborne, Usborne. A fantastic debut with a black queer character at its center. Unapologetic and well written, and yet incredibly accessible, which the judges agreed is incredibly tough to pull off. We're going to find the monster. Mallory Blackman, illustrated. <laughs> illustrated by Dapo Adiola, Puffin Book. <laughs> An instantly lovable picture book with Mallory's magical words set to Dapo's enchanting, witty, warm illustrations. This is a book that will be instantly loved and then beloved. Musical Truth, a musical history of modern black Britain in 28 songs. Jeffrey Boache, illustrated by Gadi <laughs> Faber and Faber, a social history through the lens of music which provides a great entry to understanding and teaching Black History to Children and in Schools. Jeffrey can't be here, he said, hey. <laughs> really now, <laughs> I know. <laughs> Danny Chung does not do maths. Yeah. Maisie <laughs> Chan, Piccadilly Press. A warm-hearted, hilarious middle grade story that does not shy away from the complexity of the diasporic experience and handles them deftly and generously. The Sound of Everything, Rebecca Henry, Everything with Words. <laughs> a sophisticated debut by a talented young writer with a unique, brave voice and the ability to craft a nuanced, complex narrative. And finally, The Crossing. Manjeet Man. <laughs> a powerful novel in verse that confronts big themes of displacement and grief and does so with ease, subtlety, and breathtaking turns of phrase. These are all extraordinary books and our judges agonized over their choices. As a former judge noted a couple of years ago, picking a long list and then a short list and finally a winner of the Jalak Prize is an exercise in heartbreak. As so many books are loved and beloved and must be set aside as there can only be one winner for each award. Yet let there be no doubt the Jalak Prize shortlist are testaments to the extraordinary range and quality of work being produced by writers of color in contemporary Britain. This year's, this year's shortlists are particularly striking for the bold experiments in form and genre, courageous explorations of themes and ideas, and the incredible variety of creative practice demonstrated by our shortlistees. These are books to be read and reread, to be remembered and cherished far into the future. And now, without further ado, let's move on to announcing our two winners. So first, the Jalak Children's and Young Adult Prize. Our judges said of the winner, Quote, I love this book for the warm-heartedness, humor, 
and the nuanced way it approaches the challenges of being a child negotiating multiple identities, Patrice Lawrence. Um, this is a slow burn of a book that takes a common stereotype and turns it on its head. It's one of the books that crept onto my long list and made me love it more with each new reading. Ni Aikwe Parks. When I first read it, I thought it would make a great class read for school children everywhere. A book that can be enjoyed together and then can lead to class discussions. Sufia Ahmed. Our judges unanimously selected a winner, and that is Macy Chan. does not do maths, Piccadilly Press. I don't think I can speak. <laughs> uh, I want to thank the Janet Prize and the judges for choosing Danny Chung. I didn't think I was going to win against <laughs> such juggernauts of children's literature. Um, I'm so happy. I want to say thanks to my publishers, uh, Piccadilly Press, who are here, my agent, Chloe, from Madeleine Milburn, um, my family, who should be watching from home, uh, Alma and Santi, and my husband, Jose. Um, I have to thank uh, Lila Rashid from Megaphone, who, without Lila Rashid and Megaphone, I wouldn't <coughs> be here. So thank you, Lila. Um, thanks to Writing West Midlands and Kit Duval and all of those people that have supported me. It's been a long road. I might be a debut, but I've been writing for a long time. Um, thanks to my friend Renee and Antoine for coming today to support me. <laughs> I was saying to my friend, oh, you know, remember like two decades ago when I told you I wanted to be a writer? And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> I've done it. <laughs> Uh, so thank you very much. Thanks, Sonny. <laughs> and now, the winner of the Chalak Prize 2022. Our judges said, gone are the days of limiting what can be exciting, striking, and deeply profound literature. This is an impeccable storyteller who commands the page in every way. Shemaine Suleiman. Mary Jean Chan said, I find this book to be a powerful, moving, and thought-provoking story, which shimmers with hard-earned hard wisdom and wonder, one that is beautifully written. Stephen Thompson added, there is a, this is a sumptuous book with a timeless quality to the story as it moves between time and place. Our winner for 2022 is Sabah Khan. Yes. <laughs> Khan, The Roles We Play by Myriad is a graphic novel, which is a first, not only on our shortlist, but I think as a winner for our for the Dalek Prize. So over to you, Sabah. Thank you, Sonny. Um, thank you, judges. Um, I think I'm in 
a bit of shock, really. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's going to take a while to um, acknowledge in my soul that this is happening. Um, <laughs> and I think as I'm talking, it's, it's, yeah, it's, um, yeah, I, I think it's going to take me a while. Um, uh, I guess um, my family will be uh, listening, uh, maybe not live, but a bit later, <laughs> perhaps. Um, but um, yeah, I just I can't believe that I'm here and I'm accepting this award. Uh, Thank you to the people that are in this room that are supporting me. My partner, who's there in the terracotta shirt, Mark <laughs> Bonchek, um, who's been by my side throughout this whole journey. Um, Corinne Perlman from Myriad Editions, who, who really um, let me just do what I wanted to do and um, didn't, didn't put her foot in at all at any point. <laughs> which was great. Um, Emma from EDPR, who also supported as well and really pushed it. Um, and then my mum, um, just, be, just being um, really open with her stories um, and trusting me with, with um, her memories and knowing that I would honour her in the way that I did with my book. Um, and also my inner child as well, I think. <laughs> We're here and we're doing this. It's pretty incredible. Um, so thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Finally, as we bring the official part of the evening to, the, to a close, we remind you that beyond our annual long and short lists and winners, every book submitted to the Jalak Prize is an act of disruption, defiance, challenge, and subversion. These are all part of a movement to decolonize our literatures, our imaginations, cultures, and most of all, ourselves. And for that, we are grateful to every writer who is working away at creating stories that we need to hear. So a huge thank you to all of you for being here, for celebrating with us. Those here, the party starts now, so do hang out. Uh, those at home, thank you so much for joining us. And with that, thank you and good night. Yeah.